Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Startup Savant Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan, and this show is about the stories, challenges, and triumphs of fast-scaling startups and the founders who run them. This week, we're talking with Sufian Chowdhury, founder of Kinetic Healthcare Solutions. Kinetic is bringing change to the non-emergency medical transportation industry, which primarily serves those on Medicaid using an API and digital platform. Kinetic is solving a really interesting problem, and one that seems to have been overlooked for a long time. And this is going to greatly improve the lives of a really underserved community. And of course, I couldn't go on without noting, Kinetic is yet another example of a business opportunity that was hidden, buried deep inside of the overstretched spreadsheets of their users. And as a recovering spreadsheet addict, I have a special place in my heart for these kinds of startups. Quickly before we get into the show, remember to subscribe to the podcast if you're enjoying it. That's the best way you can help us get the pod in front of more cool folks just like you. All right, I had a ton of fun with this one, and I think you will too, so let's jump into my chat with Sufian. Sufian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm excited for this. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. I'm stoked for this as well. Uh, Let's start off real easy. Can you tell us what is Kinetic? Yes, so Kinetic is a non-emergency medical transportation technology platform that connects health plans, their patients, with the appropriate transportation providers to deliver the proper level of uh, transportation services to them. What a buttoned up answer. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is the problem that Kinetic is solving? Yeah. So the non-emergency medical transportation industry, a lot of folks don't really know about it unless they're affected by it. Uh, it's primarily sponsored by Medicaid. So if you're on Medicaid, you'll most likely know about it. Uh, and a lot of the folks who use it, it's folks that are going to dialysis centers for their you know daily check-ins and so on and so forth. And so it's about three, 400 million rides a year. You're looking at 20,000 local transportation companies. And we're talking about stretcher vans or wheelchair vans. They have a lot of sedans going around picking up patients that are both on Medicaid and Medicare Advantage programs, and they'll take them to their medical appointments. Uh, so that that's basically the industry that we're solving for. And all the operators of the 20,000 transport companies, there are a ton of health plans, hundreds of health plans throughout the, uh, the country that have member members ranging in the tens of millions that, that uh, receive this service. And the uh, you know, brokers who basically broker these deals to, uh, they, they work with insurance companies. They, they sit right in the middle between the transport companies and, and the health plans where they'll go and find the pro- appropriate transport company. The transportation companies have on average about a dozen or so uh, drivers in their network that will go and pick these patients up. So very fragmented industry. Today, they still communicate telephonically or via fax. So Excellent. we're trying to digitize this non-digital marketplace. Um, and so that's basically the premise and that's what we're solving for. Yeah, yeah I, I think we've we've heard this a couple of times, but anytime you ever hear the word fax, you know that there's a, a business opportunity just like sitting there, low hanging fruit. And if you can find a way to go take it, then, uh, you know, let's replace those faxes. Um, so which parts of this, of this kind of chain of of industry or or whatever, however you want to say it, which parts is kinetic touching? I mean, are, are you guys, um, on the phone setting up these rides or are you a software system? What, what, what is the product that, uh, that kinetic offers? Yeah. So kinetic, it's really unique in the way we started the company. It wasn't necessary. The vision we have today is so different than the vision we started off with. I think that's any company that ultimately becomes successful. You've got to know when to pivot and and listen to the market and and the demand for the products. When I started it, and this is such a unique story, uh, it was literally from the back office of of a local transport company in Brooklyn. A friend of mine, Chanel Fernandez, he was operating and he owned a business, ANS Transportation, based out of Brooklyn. Go there, he's like, hey, I really need help with this database thing. I can't track my payments. I go in, I see the largest Excel sheet I've ever seen. <laughs> and I'm like, what, what? and I'm like, what is this? And, and then he goes to me, well, uh, the way it works is, you know, I, I have all these rides that I have to fulfill. I have a hundred plus drivers. They're picking up patients, they're dropping them off. And then I have to build insurance companies 
and I'm waiting about 30 to 45 days to get paid. And I'm saying to him, you don't have a central billing platform here. And he's like, no, I work with about five different insurance companies. And one of these insurance companies requires me to use a portal. Another one via fax, another one via paper invoicing. I'm like, this is a disaster. And so for the next 12 months, I quit everything. I sat in the local back offices of local transport companies throughout Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, found out they all have the same problem. And in the first 12 months, we built the first revenue cycle management platform for transportation companies. So it had nothing to do with the actual delivery component of it. We built a payment platform that allowed them to get paid on time. So instead of waiting 45 to 60 days to get paid through our system, they were getting paid in 21 days and they were able to really track all their payments for the first time, which historically they were doing on the uh, tracking it on, on this massive Excel sheet. And so that really became the entry point over the years by pivoting and listening to the market. We've built the other side of the, the, the platform as well, which was on the booking side that allowed health plans to book these rides into this network of transport companies. And when, when the transport companies are com- uh, done delivering these rides, they're then able to use our billing platform to build insurance companies. So we, we created a booking platform on one end that allows the insurance companies and brokers to book these rides into the network and then a billing platform uh, in the back end. And I'll tell you some cool stories around how this all came about. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like you found you found a an, an entry point that had a massive pain that could be solved. And now you're you're kind of using it to to become more vertically integrated as you build more products for these same these same folks. Um, I think that's that's a great I mean, that's a great way to start. Um, I see I see one other thing, you know, this goes along with the fax machine. Um, Anytime, anytime you see somebody who's just like stretching Excel just as far as it will go, it seems it seems like that should be a light bulb that's like, hey, there's a there's a business opportunity here. Um, but I want to go back to one thing you said. You said, uh, you said for the first twelve months, dot dot dot. I quit everything, and then went and sat in these back offices. When you say you quit everything, I'm assuming that means like you quit your job and you were only focused on this. And I think I also heard the word we. Um, so who is we? Did you both quit your jobs? Am I just making a lot of assumptions here? Or like, um, I mean, and if all those things are true, how did you know that this was something that was worth like quitting for and just like going headfirst into this? Yeah, so prior to this, I was actually, <laughs> the name Kinetic uh, comes from a different company that I was building. And so I quit that. Ah, gotcha. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I was always dabbling. Prior to this, I did uh, work as a, in healthcare consulting, a lot of financial analysis with different health systems and, and kind of helping them save costs and build out their network. And, and so I, I had a pretty decent understanding of healthcare on a macro level. Prior to Kinetic, I was actually building, I, I always get frustrated. One of the biggest lessons I've been taught, and this was about when I was 16, 17, a mentor of mine said, every time you have a problem, write it down. And there are two types of people in this world. There are people who complain about problems. There are people who will take that problem and come up with a solution, be the, be the person who comes up with a solution. And so I had this journal I carry carry around uh, with every problem. Like it was just a crazy, anything that bothered me, I'd write it down. And so I was stuck in a parking lot and I, I was building this uh, platform that it would connect all these vehicles to ways so you could have more accurate GPS signals. And this is back in 2015. The GPSs are way more sophisticated today, especially the last five years. And so I... I oftentimes get stuck behind like sanitation trucks and uh, school buses, especially in New York City. And so what I wanted to do was track them and then take that into Waze. And I called that company Kinetic, the energy of motion. So I was collecting all of that. And so when I came across this problem and saw that, that what I was trying to solve for initially, and I think every founder that really think about the problems they're solving, I think I was solving for a problem that I had that the world probably didn't care for as much. Whereas when I saw the problem that my friend had, it was, uh, it was just not him. It was 20,000 other transportation companies. And that was a real business. So I pivoted everything. 
inherently I'm a lazy guy, so I kept the name. It's really hard to think of a good name, so I kept the name and I pivoted the whole idea. We, as in my two co-founders, uh, Mabdub and Atif, uh, one's a, a CTO, one's the chief product officer. Uh, they were fresh out of college, and we and I was, uh, yeah, I met them through all these college conferences. And so, yeah, they dropped. I don't know what they were doing. I guess courses, and I dropped my previous company to start this. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and, and so, so you already had some co-founders and they just, they were like, yeah, let's do this. Let's, let's yeah. jump, uh, jump and make it happen. Um, so it seems to me that you, you were, you were, you were introduced to this problem by someone who you, who you knew and that the road towards a solution and understanding what type of product was that was going to be the solution i mean i guess maybe i shouldn't assume was that was that kind of a two plus two equals four type of thing or was it like a let's really look into this problem and see what it takes to fix it yeah no it was really just none of it was deliberate at first it, the, the mission and vision of our company became a lot more clear about a couple of years into it when we started even the first year it was really to build a revenue generating business that could fund all my other crazy ideas. I never thought that Kinetic would be the idea that became as big as it is today. The intention was never that. And so for me, what I was doing is I grew up, you know, spent my father in, in the restaurant business. And so for um, just understanding basic economics was so important, understanding that, you know, when you sell something, you, you can't sell it for less than you buy it. And so just having core business knowledge helped me tremendously. And so when I started this business, it was really just to build a product, not invest a ton of time or money into it, and then create a revenue generating engine that can su support all these chaotic ideas that I had in my head. Um, then what happened was as we dove deeper into it, you realize just the true nature of pain points faced by all the different stakeholders. And then uh, the, there are aspects of it that became very personal and then you make it your mission. And, and so that's, it wasn't a mission that I, I initially started off with. It was a mission that you, that just you gravitate gravitated towards because you were able to relate to the people that you were uh, serving with the product. And so that's where I think it just obsession took over to build something. Is it is it fair to say, and I apologize for using dirty language here, but is it fair to say that you were trying to build a lifestyle business? Uh, no, I was not. <laughs> I, I, I might give off that vibe. But, uh, I, I think I need to work on the lifestyle. I work too much. <laughs> I should start that next. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Something that allows you to, you know, like take a vacation every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Um, um, let's jump into uh, to customers. There was something in your all's um, uh, company profile that uh, that caught our attention. Uh, and so I'll read the quote. Um, it took five years to get 50 and then three months to get from there to 100. The initial customers were hardest to get. The first customer was the absolute hardest to get. And of course, all those numbers, the 50, the 100, those are talking about customers that you've gotten. Um, but I want to talk initially about this very first customer. Um, and if you can't use names, that's fine. Um, but can you tell us who was this first customer and, and if there's any sort of like, if they were the hardest ones to get, I'm sure that there's a story in how you ended up like getting them to actually sign on the dotted line. Yeah. So if it, I can't, I didn't know how crazy the taxi industry in New York was. Or I think any small business in New York, it, it's pretty chaotic. And so um, when I went in, I uh, he was a friend of mine. I told him we could build a product. He's like, no, everybody's promised me that we that they could build a software. They could all I need is for you to do it. Actually, the first six months, all I did was listen to him and hear him out, and he told me to build something, and it was the absolute wrong product. I remember, and I had to bring through personally $50,000 for the first six months because I was employing engineers, et cetera. I go back and he's like, well, I don't want this because it doesn't have this. And I'm like, okay, this is where I need to sit down and do market research myself. And then I asked him, can you find me anybody else? And so I found a couple of other transport companies in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx 
whose back office since I'd sit in and observe them myself. And then we built out the solution the next 12 months, which became the revenue cycle management. That was that, that uh, got to the market. It got so crazy because it was a payment product. Nobody, especially you're dealing with Medicaid, you're dealing with payments, small businesses. That's what made it very complex. And there's a bureaucratic element to it. There's a trust factor. Small businesses inherently don't have a macro level understanding of the domains they're serving. So there's a lot of different challenges that we, we had to overcome. But I remember when we f- finally built that product out and um, we built the product out, we submitted the claims and he said, I'm not going to pay you until I get paid because I still don't believe it. It works, right? Mm-hmm. We submitted the claim. Everything is good. We And... Uh, they they finally got paid 21 days later to which she wrote me a check and so that was the first one and then i'd literally have to take that check to the next tra- taxi company in brooklyn and be like here it is it works i could do the same thing with you another 45 days to get the next one and that's just what it was i remember i ended up in buffalo doing this thing right so like customer number four was in buffalo because one of their friends had a thing so i, I all of a sudden i was flying to buffalo the worst place Whoever's from Buffalo, I love people in general, but it is not a place anyone should live. So I, I fly there three times a week. And I think that's when I used to question, like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, I was building all these creative things, and here I am trying to sell the software to transport companies in this obscure marketplace that nobody knows about. <laughs> so customers number five to 12 are probably the most painful. And then, you, and then it kind of starts growing and word of mouth and all the rest. But yeah, the first oof, couple of years were painful. <laughs> and burning through money doing this, it makes it even more painful. Right. Yeah. We were we were talking a little bit about uh, doing scrappy things before the before the show started, and uh, you didn't even mention having to fly to Buffalo. I mean, ew, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Buffalo. Yeah. Well, Buffalo. I mean, rural parts of America is where where this company took me. I, I'm telling you, so ethnicity wise. Uh, from Bangladesh, my, my parents are from Bangladesh, and so I think in some of these towns in America, rural towns, I was the first Bengali man to land there. You know, that's how rural it was, and I'd be like, "What am I doing here?" I was in the middle of Oklahoma. I never thought I'd be in the middle of Oklahoma. You know, I heard so. That, that was, you look back, and like, it was pretty exciting, simply because of how never in my wildest imagination that I thought I'd go there. But um, blessing in disguise to get to see the world. Uh, th- through a very different lens. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a totally different ball game. You're not getting stuck behind sanitation trucks and school buses. You're getting stuck behind Amish wagons and <laughs> combines, basically. Yeah, it's um, some of the nicest people in the world, though. They they live in the most rural parts of of the country. So, how did you, you you've now learned this, and I'm and I'm wondering what the what the kind of key takeaway is from listening to your customers and hearing what they say when they're asking for a product and knowing how to actually turn that into the product that needs to be built to actually solve their yeah. to solve their problem how, what's the what's the what's the geometry that you have to put these problems through to to solve for that yeah i think just solving for a common denominator as opposed to just solving with one customer right so when you go out to talk to 10 or 12 or 15 potential customers, your job as the builder needs to find a common denominator in which they can buy into as opposed to, you know, you know customized solutions. And so otherwise you'll become a custom dev shop really quickly. Right. And so, you know, for us, that that's what I focused on, especially uh, after the first experience the first six months, I ventured out to more and more transport companies. And so that's how I was able to kind of figure out that common denominator had nothing to do with this massive Excel sheet or custom routing or this or that. The common denominator was they weren't getting paid on time and they didn't have a billing class and they were all using different mediums to send claims and invoices. How do we centralize that? And that took off. So yeah, look for the common denominator among many as opposed to one problem that only one enterprise has. I've never really heard it um, characterized as the it becomes very easy to become a custom dev shop. I've never heard it said like that before, and it really makes me think that there, there kind of is a, a tight line or a tightrope that you have to that you have to walk when 
the advice out there is all listen to your customer, listen to your customer, build what your customer wants. But it sounds like that's not the answer. You have to be able to take in that data. Yes, don't ignore it, but you have to be able to synthesize it and create an actual useful outcome as opposed to just, you know, ask for A, receive A, you know. Right. So that's, I because, think that's really good yeah, advice. Yeah, that goes right into valuation and scalability. Your company cannot scale if you have to do a lot of custom dev work. Don't really get the valuation uh, on your company if it requires that much customization, right? So for, for I, I think what they should say, customer is plural in the same industry, solving for the same problem, you know? Uh, otherwise, you want, we've, everybody's, but, and also for us, because we didn't start off with this mission to change NEMT, we did, I, I had no idea what NEMT was. I was simply building a solution, again, to generate revenue so to, I, I could do all these creative things. Um, so that's where, for me, I guess that's how, because it started the way it did, I had to go out and find what the problem was and what the customer, who the customers were, as opposed to somebody who might be mission-driven, might already have identified their customer group and so that that might be a different approach but for, for like how kinetic started i had to take that approach of finding a common denominator among many customers and trying to figure out what i'm solving for on the fly gotcha yeah and and i know you you've said it once before but i'm gonna say it again n-e-m-t non-emergency medical transport correct non-emergency medical transportation okay. yeah fantastic all right so you said a magic word and it is uh it is going to lead us into a different conversation that I wanted to have with you. Um, you said valuation. Um, so let's talk about everyone's favorite subject and that is money. Um, so I know that, uh, I know that kinetic has some really big things, um, on the horizon, uh, for 2023, but before we talk about the future, uh, can you tell us how kinetic is currently funded? Yeah, so it's primarily funded uh, through angels, uh, angel investors who are high net worth individuals uh, looking for deals that are, are basically in the early stages, um, and you know a few small family funds that that have invested in Kinetic over the last five years. We've had multiple rounds of funding of which they all you know participated in, and we've raised twenty million dollars uh, to date. Gotcha. And that $20 million, I, I actually, there is something that I missed that I, that I need to ask about. You have not just built this one product you've built, I think, what was it? Two or three different products now? Yeah. For the same industry. Okay. Right? For, there are multiple stakeholders. So we're building up product lines for different stakeholders that are basically connecting this fragmented marketplace. Gotcha. So that's what that 20 million has gone towards. Um, right. And that's, I mean, for angel funding, that's, that's quite a bit. You must have had a ton of different conversations. Um, I, yeah, so you definitely have to have a ton of conversations. So how it got started for me is uh, a mentor of mine, Ken Peters, he introduced me to his brother and his brother, Barry Peters, basically has a history of uh, deal making in, on Wall Street. Um, and he was retired at that time, <laughs> didn't really want to participate in anything. and kept nagging him and nagging him and i initially raised the first twenty five thousand dollars ken peters and a few of his friends and and that twenty five thousand dollars was what we built after i exhausted probably more than over a hundred thousand of my own money raised 20 and that twenty five thousand felt better than my own money simply because you got external validation oh yeah yeah so that was really good brought that in extended the runway for about four months at that time it's just three or four of us just squeezing away building away and built up enough, I guess, benchmark numbers to get Barry excited. And so Barry is a career deal maker. I did not leave him alone, nor did his brother for about 18 months. And then Barry brought in Tom Turner, who became a board director, and then Jim Bellinson. And then that just, I mean, it, I got into now like some of the top PE firms in the country, but the, the CEOs who are sep, you know, investing privately in Kinetic. And then when we're ready for the institutional rounds, their uh, funds will come in. So it's just a lot of uh, resilience and not giving up and connecting the dots. We're all connected to someone who has money. And that's just the reality. It's getting that person to see it. And it's very hard. It's, it's, it takes a lot of uh, resilience. And, and then once you build that network, then word of mouth spreads and more people want to come into the deal. 
All right. So you, you've got me, you've got me interested. I know I said I wanted to talk about money and we'll get back to that. I will put a pin in it right here, but you've mentioned mentors a couple of times. Um, was Ken Peters the mentor who told you to write all your problems down? No. Okay. So you've had multiple yeah. different mentors. Uh, I, yeah, I was like, lucky. I mean, John, Jonathan Wiedenbaum was another one. So I had, I had so many, I, I'm so fortunate to have as many mentors. I've always sought help. I realized that I didn't know much from a pretty early age. And so I was just inherently curious, which is one of our core values in the company. I was inherently a curious person. And so for me, I just go college professors, high school teachers, anybody and anyone that was doing remotely anything interesting. I would just ask to get coffee with them and learn from their experience. I was just so interested in how people just got to where they were in life. And, and I think when, when you get to that point, do, your motivation becomes helping others that are seeking help. And so it, it's not very hard to find mentors, but yeah, mentors, I think are absolutely pivotal for everybody. Just sounding bored, someone you can talk through about things, someone who can guide you, uh, in a world where you could get lost pretty quickly. Well, so you said something really interesting there. Interesting. Uh, be interested, um, which is, you know, essentially what gets you into, you know, into those rooms, uh, you know, being interested in, in what your college, uh, professor or something, that's an awesome place to start by the way, because I think a lot of people are, um, intimidated to reach out to these big fancy people with the names that everyone knows. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you can, this this global network exists so if you can get in with a high school teacher or or a, a college professor who can end up you know kind of like leapfrogging you into those people who who may be more um more specific to what you need that's an awesome way to do it um but back to back to being interested i think that th there's a quote out there and the quote is to be interesting be interested and it seems to me that you're not going to get passed on, you know, you, nobody, nobody is going to pass your name on if they just think that you're out to get something or something like that. So really taking an actual interest in these people, even if they're not the final goal, quote unquote, of the person you're looking for, if you are interested, you will be interesting and they will want to pass you on to that next level. Um, so I think that's they, really there's cool. There's a really good book. And there's a, 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 a lot of you have probably read this, uh, they're your peers, uh, how to win friends and influence people. And there, uh, the author talks about one particular conversation where he barely had any words to say at this party. And the person he was talking to ended up saying at the end of a uh, 20, 30 minute conversation, I don't know how long it was, I forgot this, it was years ago, I read it. Um, but that was the most interesting conversation she'd ever had. Meanwhile, he's not said much. And so I think for you, genuinely, you need to show a ton of interest in what others are doing, be curious. And also when you present yours, like you said, you can't say, well, I need this or that. Let them determine what they need to give you. You need to show them why you are the person that's going to solve this problem. And you've got to explain a uh, uh, passion in a way which they've never seen. And I think that's worked very well in my favor. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. Okay. I'm coming back to the pin. All right. So we were talking about funding. Uh, you let us know that kinetic is funded on some big angels. Um, but let's talk about the future. What, um, what's going on in 2023? What are you, what are you out there doing? A lot. So we're really excited. So last year is there monumental year for us we uh open book so i'll talk about it i don't know if i'll get in trouble with the board but it's okay uh, we were at half we closed the year at half a million arr uh in 2021 and this past year we did eight million Ooh. uh so it's a massive growth year for us we went from about 20 employees to 100 employees you know and so now it's building up the organization and operations to support all of this. It took about five years to see, get the industry to see what kinetics building on the infrastructure side where historically, you know, um, health plans or even brokers, the way they manage this program is retrospectively. Let's say I'm a health plan. I hire a broker to manage this program. They'll hire a whole bunch of escort companies. Transfer companies complete these rides and then send me an invoice. The only way I'll know what happens to my patient population and members that I'm managing from a health plan's perspective 
is when I got an invoice 45 days later. So they were managing this program retrospectively. And what Kinetic is doing for the first time, it's creating this real-time experience where the health plan when they request rights for their members or even the brokers in this industry who request rights for their members, they have full visibility into the transport company's network. Similar to how we use Uber or Lyft today, you get to request that ride, you get to see the vehicle moving and coming to you. For the first time, patients are able to have that experience. And then just going back since we're around that, our mission and our vision, our vision is that any patient anywhere can request a ride and they could see uh, how many uh, rides they have allotted for them from their insurance company. They could request that ride, whether it's a wheelchair or a stretcher van or a sedan, they get the ride and instead of it charging their credit card, it charges their insurance in real time. That's the vision we have. We need to work with existing players in the marketplace, like the health plans, like the brokers, like the passport companies or the Ubers and Lyfts of the world, like the drivers. And we've created this platform where now we're connecting all the stakeholders. And so this that's what we're trying to build. It's going to cost a lot of money as it has, right? So we're uh, we're doing another bridge round to get to the Series A, uh, which we're looking at in, in the $50 million. Can you tell range. us what a bridge round is? Sure. Basically, it bridges you to the next round, right? So, uh, you know, tech companies, when you're building technology, when you're building infrastructure, there's a lot of upfront cost associated with it. And once you penetrate a marketplace, you start monetizing the service, then you either ramp up in revenues. Very typical, right? Tech company build out. Uh, so we're at that point where we're about to hit that inflection point and we, we need more re- uh, uh, investments to get to profitability. And so for us, uh, a bridge round, basically, as you're negotiating or as you're building the storyline and narrative for the institutional investors, you may run out of money or you need to extend that runway. And so it, what a bridge round does, it, it helps you extend your runway as you raise your institutional round or the next round of financing. Uh, the, the institutional f- uh, investors have different metrics that they look for compared to angel investors or family funds, right? So the type of investors vary and what they look for varies. And so uh, a bridge round is very appealing to our uh, angel investor or small family fund who may not have a chance to get into the institutional round because you know, oftentimes in an institutional round, you know, you'll have two or three funds that just wrap up the whole thing. All right. At the risk of sounding um, ill-informed, could you could you say that it's like a, um, it's kind of like an extension of the previous round without having to go through all of the different um, negotiations and valuation and all that good stuff of a new round? Or is that not the right way to think about it? Sort of. I mean, it's just deal making, right? At the end of the day, fundraising is deal making. Selling a product is deal making, right? So, uh, for it depends on where you are. If you have a ton of leverage, for example, we raised, we completed our last round last year, around this time, um, and and the valuation of this is going to be basically a discount to the next round. Now, last year's uh, valuation was at a particular point, given all of our accomplishments in the prior years. This year, we've grown you know, all substantially from half a million to 8 million. So in ARR, so for us, uh, we wouldn't price it at last year's price point. We're just going to do a discount. And oftentimes when you're raising money, uh, from angel investors or family funds who aren't familiar with the space, you'll raise it on a convertible note, which basically converts into the next round, but at a discount. So we're not necessarily piggybacking off of last year. You would have to do that if you didn't accomplish much and you're about to have a down round or all that. But because of all the things we've accomplished, we're not in, we were fortunate to not have to extend last year's. Rather, we could come up with a more um, lucrative deal for, for the existing sh- uh, stakeholders where it's uh, a discount to the next. Cool. All right. Thanks for, thanks for explaining that. Um, so then let's talk more about this next round. You said this was going to be your next round. Your next big round is your A round. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on depending on who you ask, um, you may either be, you know, unfortunate or uh, for, you know, even even other people may be crazy for raising or trying to raise around in 2023. But um, there's obviously uh, everybody's got to do what they've got to do. And it sounds like you are in 
an excellent position, you're able to show this massive growth um, that you may not be in kind of those, uh, um, you may not, you may be insulated a little bit from the kind of market forces that are, that are happening, you know, right now. Um, what, what are you seeing out there? Uh, as you're looking, you know, you've got your eyes directly on it. You're going to, you know, you're going to be raising what, what are you seeing out there in the, in the kind of, um, the VC markets, uh, maybe differently than what you would have expected to see last year, or the year before. Right. I think, uh, for us, because we've been in stealth mode for quite some time, if we raised money last year or the year prior, uh, from institutions, um, we'd have gotten absolutely ludicrous valuations and all that stuff. But for us, we, we've never been in the game of trying to raise money because valuation is high. Ultimately for every company, supply and demand prevails and the intrinsic price of that company will be its intrinsic price. And that's that. I think too often it, founders get too caught up in the valuations and how much they need to raise and so on and so forth and forget just day-to-day -day execution. And because we've executed quietly for, in stealth mode, what happens, venture capitalists, they also raise a lot of money during that time, right? So VCs invest money into tech companies, but all these funds also raise money. Right. They have a ton of capital sitting there. They're just more cautious than what they put the money in. So in times like this, quality prevails, and that's why every founder should build quality companies and products and not just build things off of ideas that may or may not work. So you're going to get funded. And so a lot of these, we're talking to all the top venture funds that are out there because they see that the company has substance and it's not just an idea that they're about to fund. They're about to find something that has legs. Now it's just a matter of running with it. Right, right. And it, and it sounds like you were never, you never had the idea yourself and you were never kind of forced into this whole uh, now taboo somehow idea of growth at all costs. Just grow. It doesn't matter what your business model is. Just grow, get more customers, get more users. You can monetize later. It sounds like you never, you never were anywhere near that trap. No, I think for me, it was always building a good business, right? Like I, I, I could care less about uh, these absurd valuations raising from all the big names. Like for me, what's e even similar to how you build a company and culture is important amongst the employees. When you build a board, that needs to seep right into that, that culture of the board you have and also your investors. All of it is aligned because that's also a team of people you're managing, your investors. And they need to buy into the company culture. So for the top, you know, maybe the best venture capital funds in the world are not a cultural fit for us and vice versa, right? So for it's not getting too caught up in all of that, just staying focused on the fundamentals of business development, do something that's very mission driven, get people to buy into it. You'll be fine. So in one of the conversations that we were having before, before this interview, you mentioned something about that you like to structure deals where they benefit both the, the startup and the investors. Can you say more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's deal making, right? For me, I'm in a precarious position where you represent employees, you represent the board, and you represent investors depending on who, where you are negotiating, right? So for you as a CEO, it's a balancing act. When you're raising funding, you're raising money so that you could pay employees market rates or you could pay them more than market rates or you could pay towards benefits that they're looking for. They're working from home. Can you support that? Can you buy them desks at home? Can you give them tickets to come to the meeting? Like all that stuff you, you're considering, but then also at what cost? There's a cost to everything. And what does that come at a cost of borrowing that money or bringing that money in from the investor side? And that's just a very delicate balance of finding that right. And you'll never, it's such a, it, it's an art, right? So it's saying, okay, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with dilution of 25% here because the investment we make in employees will bring back 10x growth on the other side of the equation. So that's how I look at, at funding, deal making on all, all sides. Gotcha. Speaking of employees, um, we've, we've seen well, there's been a lot there's been a lot that's happened um in the uh, in the past few months um obviously we've got interest rates going crazy which has just caused all these bonkers things to happen um but we've also got uh you know vcs saying to buckle down and ensure that you have a strong cash position into late 2023 or 2024 i've even heard 
as late as 2025 that you need to, you know, assume that you need to have cash until those points. And then we've also, and, and you know, who would have, who would have ever guessed that something like this would happen? We've got Elon coming into Twitter and slashing, you know, 50% or whatever it was of employee count, which seems to have created some, some sort of, you know, uh, switch in the brain of, of a ton of different um, CEOs and founders who are then on top of all the other market situations. They're now seeing him, the, you know, richest man in the world or the smartest guy on, you know, in Silicon Valley or whatever you want to say, coming in and saying, we can run Twitter with several hundred people. It doesn't need to be several thousand people. And all this being said, it is leading to, you know, more lean teams or in some cases layoffs. Um, and you all have grown quite a bit. With all those things being said, are you thinking about hiring or team size, team makeup um, any differently than you have been in the past? Yes. So it's always good to like see what's going on uh, and some, fr again, from a very macro level and industry wide. And uh, of course, a lot of companies don't need as many employees that they have, but, but during good times, you're hiring, you're feeling positive, you're feeling great, and you feel, you're going to invest a lot more in R&D and you want to tackle the world. And during bad times, you then stop investing in those initiatives and focus on your core uh, uh, mar market offerings. And that's just cyclical, and it happens every every cycle right, as it goes down, as markets go down. This is very common place. Um, so for us, it's good to know all of this, but we can't hinder growth, right? Uh, we're going to raise the money we need to build the business we need to successfully get it to profitability, and that will. You know, so we're building it based on what's needed in the company. Bad times, you'll have lower valuation. Good times, you'll have high valuation. But we'll work its way out, like I said, over the course of decades. And oftentimes, companies should not be seen as, "Hey, I'm building it for five years and I'm out." You're building the infrastructure, and you should, every at least for me, of a business that will outlast me or my tenure as a CEO at, at this place. So, for, for me, it's always been a very long-term plan. And if it's a very long-term plan, you won't really get too concerned with these, you know, month to month or year to year trends because your vision is longer term horizon, 10, 20 year vision. It will take time. We're ups and downs will work its way out. We're, we're hiring, we're slated to hire over a hundred people the next year. So whoever uh, is looking for a great place to work, <laughs> reach out to us. Awesome. That's great. Um, well, it, it, I think I think something that you've mentioned a couple times before is that it really comes down to being mission driven, as opposed to just wanting to build a company that makes money. Um, and if you care about the mission and you care about the problem that you're solving and the people for whom you are solving the problem, then you know it 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 kind of like you said maybe smooths out those month to month things and and hard times are still hard, but at least they're not, you're not questioning why am I doing this? You know? Right. Yeah, exactly. Because those companies that are slashing folks, they're going to hit their numbers. They'll go back. They'll get more investors. Their market cap's going to go up. They'll go raise more money and they'll start hiring again. So it's just natural cycle of it for you. It's just understanding all this and how it impacts you. It will definitely impact your business. But um, again, longer term horizon, building things quietly and slowly, no need to get on every publication because you're dying to get on it. Just just putting your head down and working and, and just uh, taking a egoless approach to building stuff will probably help you survive all this chaos. <laughs> Was there something that you wish that you knew about raising money, about you know funds, about using that those funds? Is there anything that you wish you knew before you launched? kinetic yeah like i feel like all the things i've done the last five years i could probably do it in a few months i didn't fundraising now um so much i think initially I, I i was i always wanted to build a tech company i, I was always a very business driven person um and i always wanted to raise money but i, I wanted to raise money but i didn't know what it meant you know like i, I was so i was such a novice when i came to this oh i'm gonna raise money but you don't realize that you're making a deal and it's it's all deal making, right? And uh, your vision is a commodity, you know? So it's all of this I didn't know. Um, 
I didn't know the art of deal making at all. I, I did. I, I think, oh, I got to just go in and sell them on this and all that. It's really a deal making. What I learned is a sales approach, right? When you're doing enterprise sales, we're in enterprise sales where if you want to close a deal with a broker or a health plan in our space, it can take anywhere from six to, to 18 months. Same thing with fundraising. There are companies will invest in you after building two to three years of relationship with you. There are companies will invest in you within six months. It's literally the art of deal making and relationship building. And when the time is right, the investors will strike. I think that's a really good answer. All right. Um, we're going to move into some of the uh, wrap up questions because I know that we are almost at time and you've got lots of fun things to do. Let's go with a real easy one. What is next for Kinetic? The Kinetic, uh, the, we, we really want to bring this to the hands of, uh, of patients. Uh, I, I think for me, growing up, I, I grew up in, in some crazy town here in Jamaica, Queens. Very rough. <laughs> My family, we didn't have much growing up. We were on Medicaid as well. So a lot of these patients are on Medicaid. And I look back at when, we, when I was on the program, when I was a child growing up, you didn't question the status quo at all. Because it was given to you, you already feel guilty for take, you know, being in these programs. So you're not going to question it. The reason I say it is because today, if a Medicaid patient needs to arrive, they need to request it 72 hours in advance. That's the status quo that we're challenging. In a world where everything, it takes you 20, five minutes, two minutes to get your Uber, Lyft ride, Uber Eats comes in 20 minutes. A healthcare ride is taking you uh, 72 hours of advanced booking. So that's in a way unjust, unethical, um, and solving for that, and, and not just for this year, but for the coming years, and for you know Kinetic to bring it to life, which is that any patient, irrespective of being Medicaid or Medicare or where you fall in in, in terms of wealth, uh, you deserve a, a very good experience, especially when it comes to your health. One, be able to make you uh, get that request in, get that ride within twenty to thirty minutes, maybe a couple of hours. And go to your doctor's appointment and not have to book it 72 hours in advance to five different phone calls. Thank you. Thank you for building an experience that uh, that the people that truly need it, I mean, they, they truly need it. And, and not necessarily in a lot of cases is it a, just a bad experience, but in some cases, these people don't have, they don't get to have that experience. They just don't go to their doctor's appointments because they, whether they either aren't aware or the, the, the roadblocks are too high to make that call, to, uh, to, to send that fax, to <laughs> go, you know, to get their ride. Some people just can't get over that, that hump and they just don't go to their, their doc. And that's, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it causes all sorts of havoc upstream in, in the greater healthcare world, but also, you know, Going back to the rural part, when I was going, a quick story, rural, I was in Oklahoma requesting a ride, uh, Uber ride, 30 minutes. Shut it off, turn it back on. I was saying something's wrong with my application. Next one, 35 minutes. I open up Lyft, 40 minutes. I go to the hotel concierge. I'm like, hey, B, what's wrong here? My Uber app isn't working properly. And they're like, oh, no, no, it's on average about 45 minutes. Oh, my gosh. For you to get your ride in parts of america we're spoiled by living in major cities and metropolises and rural parts of america rural pockets it can take you upwards of 30 to 45 minutes to get a uber ride that you're paying for mm -hmm. you will not get a ride that's subsidized by the government period and so that is the sad reality of the world that we don't see because we don't live in their shoes and, and so that's i think uh monumental for us to be able to break that barrier yeah absolutely i mean this is not this is not a term that i think a lot of folks that live in these bigger areas understand, but um, next town over, like your ride yeah. is coming from <laughs> the next town over, meaning that they're on yeah. a, you know, they're coming from one small town with a gas station on a 55 mile an hour back road to your yes. small town with another gas station. That's, that's what makes those two things towns is that they each have a gas station. So exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's a more people world. need to take road trips across America, and I think you'll—it's uh, very humbling. It—it it really is. It really is. All right. What is your number one piece of advice for early stage entrepreneurs? 
Um, don't get caught up in the hype. You know, suppress your ego. Um, build something of substance. Do it with good intention. Don't have an ulterior motive to do what you're doing. Um, again, it's so easy to get caught up on, oh, I raised this much, or I made it to this publication, or I did this or that. It's not about you, and if it's about you, you're going to fail, ultimately. And even if you make it, people are going to despise you. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to be liked by everybody. But uh, do everything you do with conviction. It's going to work its way. You know, do it long term. Markets are going to work it, themselves out. Do it quietly. Um, don't have ulterior motives. Focus. Build a product that is a problem not for you, but for the industry of people. Um, and find good people to spend yourself with and investors and the money and the team and all the rest will come. If there's just one of those traps that, uh, that you see most people fall into, which, which one is it? Ego. Ego? Ego is the worst thing for any, anybody, let alone an investor or a CEO. Nobody wants to work with somebody. You've seen it. You can't build a great culture with somebody who runs it with tremendous amount of ego ego is great there's always negative connotations around you ego is great if you could kind of uh filter it properly towards passion and not towards uh it's all about me um so yeah ego for sure could kill you easily all right where can people connect with you online and how can our listeners support kinetic yeah so i have always been a very low-key guy i don't have social media actually Whoa. i was forced to open it by my great marketing leader here yasi she's sitting there laughing um so linkedin i think is the best way to stay in touch with me uh i'm trying to be more active there and, and try to share as much as i can there so you can chatter in kinetic you'll probably just find me there um our website kinetic.care a new one's about to pop up in about 30 days so you guys will like what you see how to support Kinetic, it's, um, I think it's an enterprise solution, um, but, you know, voice your concerns. If, if you are on Medicaid or if you know somebody that's on Medicaid, voice your concerns to the health plans around the fact that it's 72 hours and that, that they should look towards uh, moving away from that and not, not letting this uh, status quo prevail. So. Awesome. Great advice. Um, and for the folks listening, that is kinetic with a K at the beginning and the end. Um, but don't worry about spelling it because all you need to know is startupsavant.com slash podcast where you'll find all the show notes, links, and everything that we talked about in today's show. Um, Sufian, thanks for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. I think there's really good, solid, and actionable advice here. Um, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for thanks. bringing it. Yeah, thanks for bring, uh, bringing me to this podcast. Really appreciate your time, and uh, I hope everybody got something out of this. Awesome. All right, that's going to be it for this week's episode of the Startup Savant Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Remember that alongside the audio-only version of the show, we also released the full video versions over on YouTube. So if you haven't checked that out yet, be sure to get on it. All right, folks, we'll see you next week. And until then, go and build something beautiful. Startup Savant Podcast is produced by Truick.